Previously, we have discussed how light propagates in vacuum. Now, in this lecture, we are going to discuss how light propagates in non-magnetic materials. We know that light propagates in free space with speed c. But when light propagates inside a medium, its speed gets reduced. But why does it happen? Well, when it propagates inside a medium, it will encounter electrical charges and the incident electromagnetic waves excites these electrical charges, which then re-emit light. Now, the superposition of the incident and the re-emitted light gives a net beam that appears to propagate with a different velocity v than c. Now, in this video, we are going to establish the expressions for the charges and current which are induced by the incident light. And in the next video, we are going to see how these induced charges and currents are incorporated into Maxwell's equation. And then from that, we will derive how an electromagnetic wave propagates in a dielectric medium. Okay, so now we will introduce three terms that will help us to describe propagation of light in a dielectric medium. These three terms are surface densities, volume densities, and current densities produced by polarization charges. Now, we are going to derive expressions for these three terms in terms of polarization vector. This polarization vector is a property of the material through which light is passing through. It is induced by external light incident in the material. Now, before we proceed, let me clarify one thing. The surface density, volume density, and current density that we are going to talk about comes from charges bound to the atoms. We will not talk about free charges. So for now, we'll be discussing propagation of light in a dielectric or non-conductive medium, not in metals which carry free charges. So let us first define the polarization vector. So let's say we have a neutral atom like this. And now if an external electric field like this is applied on this neutral atom, then the atom will act like a dipole, like this. Now this happens because this electric field which points in this direction when applied to the neutral atom pushes the plus charge in this direction and the minus charge in this direction and that's how it creates a dipole and now if the separating distance between the plus and minus charge is delta then the dipole moment can be defined as the charge of the dipole Qp times the vector delta which points from negative to positive charge. So we have seen how an electric field induces electric dipoles on a neutral atom. Now polarization vector is defined as a collection of dipoles inside a unit volume. So, this is the electric dipole moment for one molecule, right? Then, the polarization vector is defined as the total dipole moment per unit volume. Say that we have n number of molecules per unit volume in the material. Now, if we consider that in that unit volume, each atom carries 
the same type of moment, we can write the polarization vector to be equal to the number of molecules per unit volume n times the dipole moment for each molecule. But in general, we have an inhomogeneous material, right? For those cases, the polarization vector varies from point to point inside the material. Okay, so now let's turn to charge polarization surface density. So, let us first consider a more general case where the polarization of the material is not uniform. Then, if we apply an external electric field on that material, the charges will get non-uniformly distributed across the material's volume. And also, there will be charges on the material's surface boundaries. But what happens in a special case where the material is isotropic? That is, the polarization is uniform throughout the material. Then, there will be net accumulation of polarized charges only at the material's boundaries. So here figure 3 considers a special case where the material is isotropic. Now if we apply electric field on this material in this direction, well, you will see that there is no net accumulation of charges in this region. Rather all the charges are accumulated at these borders as you can see. Now, here is a further illustration of how in an isotropic material, the charges are stored on the surfaces, not in the middle. This description is very easy and you can go through this on your own. Okay, so now let's find out the relationship between the surface density of the polarization charge and the polarization. So let's say we are applying an electric field in this direction on an isotropic material. Then there will be net charges in the top and bottom surface of this material but not in the middle. Let's say the cross-sectional area of the material is A and the thickness of the top layer is delta. So, the volume of this top layer is A times delta. Now, let's say the number of molecules per unit volume is N. So, then the total number of molecules in this top layer should be N times the volume of this top layer, which is A times delta. And each molecule in this top layer who creates a dipole contributes an amount of charge QE to the surface. Okay, so the total amount of charge in this layer should be equal to the amount of charge contributed by each molecule here times the number of molecules. That is QE times N times A times delta. Then the surface charge density will be given by this total polarizing charge divided by the area of the surface which is QE times N times delta. Now on the other hand the total dipole moment on this layer is equal to the dipole moment due to one molecule times the total number of molecules in that layer. Then what is the dipole moment per unit volume? Well, we have to divide this quantity by the volume of the layer, A delta. Now this A delta and A delta cancels out and we get N times the polarization for a molecule, which is actually QE times delta. And if you look carefully, you will see that this dipole per unit volume 
which we call the polarization, is actually equal to the polarization surface charge density. That is, the polarization surface charge density is numerically equal to the polarization inside the material. Now, although we have shown the analysis above over an extended area, actually the argument is also valid for the case of a more localized area on the surface. The above equation is also true for a more localized surface. That is, the local surface charge density depends on the local value of the polarization vector. Now, in the previous example, we have considered the situation where the surface is perpendicular to the polarization vector, like this. But it does not have to be this case always. In many occasions, we can encounter boundaries which do not align perpendicular to this polarization vector. So, for example, like this orientation or this orientation. So, we'll now find the charge polarization surface density along an arbitrary surface. Before that, let us consider two special cases where the surface is perpendicular to this polarization vector and where it is parallel to the polarization vector. Now, when the surface is perpendicular to the polarization vector P, like this, then the polarization surface charge density is equal to the polarization in magnitude. But when they are parallel, the polarization surface charge density is actually equal to zero. As no net charge crosses the surface. Okay, now for any arbitrary surface like this, how do we relate the magnitude, of the polarization vector and polarization surface charge density? Well, we can actually express this area in terms of a horizontal component and a vertical component. Well, for the vertical component, the surface charge density is actually equal to zero as no net charge is passing through the surface, right? For this polarization. And for the horizontal component, the surface charge density is actually equal to the magnitude of the polarization vector as it is passing perpendicularly through the surface. Well, then how do we relate the surface charge density for this area with this polarization? Well, it's actually not that tough. All you have to do is take a component of the polarization vector which is perpendicular to this area, like this. Then the surface charge density through this surface will be equal to the magnitude of this component of polarization vector which we can easily write as P cos theta if this polarization is P and this angle is theta. So you see we can write sigma n which is the surface charge density of this surface is equal to the magnitude of the polarization vector P times cosine of theta, which we can write as polarization vector dot unit normal to that surface. Okay, so until now we have considered the case for isotopic materials only. And in case of anisotropic materials, the polarization vector P is not uniform. 
which can actually give rise to a net accumulation of charge inside the dielectric. And this localization of charges at the interior of a volume is actually better described by a volume charge density than a surface charge density. Okay, so now let's see how to evaluate the volumetric charge polarization density. So let us consider this small portion of the material. Let's say its volume is V and the area of the surface is S. Now previously we have found out that P dot N is the amount of bound charge passing per unit surface of the area. Now to get the total amount of bound charge crossing the boundary of this volume V, we have to integrate this quantity for the whole surface S. But we know that for the surface to have this amount of charge, the inside of the volume should have equal amount of opposite charge. So the net change of charge inside this volume, delta Q, will be equal to minus this quantity as you can see here. Now let's say that this charge is distributed in this volume V with the charge density rho. Then we can write it down as the volume integral of this rho. Then we can write down these two quantities to be equal. Now let me remind you that we have introduced the Gauss's theorem to you before, which relates surface integral to volume integral. So by using Gauss's theorem, we can write down the surface integral to be equal to the volume integral of the divergence of polarization vector. So putting this value in this equation, we see that both the sides have volume integrals. And as this equation is valid for any arbitrarily small volume, we can write down these two integrands to be equal, which leads us to this equation. That is the definition of polarization charge volume density. Okay, so this expression for polarization charge volume density that we have developed is even valid when the driving electric field varies with time. That means this volume density changes with time. And this time rate of change of polarization charge density leads to polarization current density, which you express by J vector. And since these polarization charges are real charges, they should obey the conservation of charges, which is given by this equation. You can actually easily verify this equation by putting the value of polarization charge volume density from this equation. And if you are not familiar with this conservation of charge equation, well, I will add a derivation of this equation at the end of this note.